Hi, I'm Charity Roby. Um, I'm delighted to be here uh, at the Oxford Symposium for the first time. Uh, I'm very grateful to the organizers of the symposium for extending the definition of the term awful to include vegetable awful, which is my topic. Um, as I prepared my talk, awful was everywhere, expanding its reach into world politics, where the Brexit vote here and the candidacy of Donald Trump in the US are revolting messes too terrible to contemplate but impossible to ignore. But for the next 20 minutes, I will stick to vegetable awful and how notions of what makes a fruit or vegetable uh, desirable are shaped. Oh, oh, there it goes. Um, last fall, I found myself in possession of a 1.3 kilogram sweet potato. It was part of a CSA share, a community supported agriculture share. I was one of the last ones to pick up. So my three pounds of potatoes was one potato. <laughs> I was not enthusiastic about taking home uh, such a substantial vegetable. I wondered if it would be stringy. I worried that I would need a, some sort of a power tool to cut it up. I thought perhaps if I tried to cook it whole, which I like to do, and fail to prick enough steam holes in it, it would blow the door off my oven if it exploded. Uh, I, was, I was full of reservations. And I expressed those to Kurt Erickson, who is the farmer uh, sitting uh, next, well, he and Maggie are the, the farmers who raised uh, the sweet potato. Oh, uh, well, they raised a lot of sweet potatoes. That wasn't the only one. Um, and he said, well, yeah, they intimidate a lot of folks. Uh, it's, it's big, but it tastes just as good. It keeps better. And once you cook this one, I have several more in the back. And you're, uh, trust me, you're going to want them. So I thought, all right, fine. I resolved not to let myself be intimidated by a root vegetable. Instead of fearing it, I saw opportunity, thanks to Kurt, bucking the tradition of tiny boiled onions at the holiday meal and the trendy practice of serving carrots the size of swizzle sticks. I would roast and serve this massive tuber whole. So I did. Martin, what am I? No, if you, I think you just go like that. Oh, that one, okay. I did, and it was a great success. But I had to ask myself, why was, what was the problem? What was my problem? Why, why did I have these doubts about the potato? It was, it was fine. I mean, it, I had to cook it a longer, and I had to you know, rotate it in the oven a few times. But it was, uh, it was fantastic. And I was able to cook it whole. I decided that I would do that instead of taking the coward's way out and cutting it into pieces. So I asked, well, why, not just why did I have this reaction, but why was I not the only one? No one else wanted this potato either. Why are large or irregular fruits and vegetables accepted and even celebrated at some times and considered disgusting or freakish at others? Why do our reactions to abnormal fruits and vegetables occur? And, and what does this tell us about our food preferences and prejudices? And how does this current interest in curbing food waste fit into contemporary beliefs about the wholesomeness, the nutrition, nutrition and the deliciousness of vegetable awful. Oh, all right. So I thought I would start with, with folklore because um, I think giant fruits and vegetables are pretty much a fixture in folklore and children's literature. And it's a kind of expression of our collective imagination. And it's a completely wholesome and, and beneficent expression. There's nothing, it's, it's very, hard, I, very hard to find negative examples. Uh, the giant turnip is a tale of a root. It's a Russian folk tale uh, that grows so large it takes three generations of a family plus all the household animals lined up to pull it out of the earth. It's an old Russian tale. It used to be told in couplets. It's traditionally told in couple, couplets. It's been reused and repurposed in many songs and literary works. Afanasyev, the Russian Folklore Authority, described versions in Russian, Swedish, Lithuanian, Ukrainian, and Spanish. Um, and it's a, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful story. It has uh, a lot of the words rhyme in Russian, and uh, it's, it's a wonderful uh, uh, folk tale to hear, to hear told. Um, Another example of this uh, phenomenon is Momotaro, the Peach Boy, a famous, uh, very well-known Japanese folk tale. 
In this story, a giant peach floats down the river and brings a cherished son to a childless couple. Um, the, uh, while we're on the subject of giant peaches, don't forget Roald Dahl, James and the Giant Peach. In his story, an enormous peach saves the orphan James from a grim existence and transports him to a life of adventure. In American uh, folklore, Zora Neale Hurston, who is a wonderful collector of African American uh, oral history and tales, recorded many, many tales of uh, legends and, and uh, stories of ordinary, by ordinary people, and many of them describe pumpkins, cabbages, enormous corn, giant cucumbers, and watermelons. And one of my favorites is her sweet, the sweet potato story uh, that was told to her. Uh, it was an oral tale, a uh, potato so large that it was cut into timber and the sawdust fed the entire state of Florida and was said to be even larger than the somewhat lumpy uh, Florida sweet potato uh, depicted here. Uh, giant, uh, well, companies who market fruits and vegetables have long used images of giants in advertising directed at children, depicting vegetables as fun, silly, or wholesome. This is a giant pear. Uh, that formed, actually this is, they're all giant pears. All those l people are also uh, carrying giant pears. So it, there are a lot of giant pears in this, in this image. Um, and this was sort of the center of the Washington, Oregon Pear Bureau's appeal to children and their families to eat more pears. And um, in the early 20th century, the Minnesota Valley Company began selling a very large variety of pea, the Prince of Wales, and to do that, they invented a spokesman called the Green Giant. And here he is with a pea pod as big as a kayak, and he's got a pretty big ear of corn in back of it, too. Um, the Jolly Green Giant went on to become an enduring symbol for the brand, and he's still selling vegetables to American families. In the realm of politics, or government, um, American exceptionalism may have had its first flowering in the realm of cucumbers. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison were early proponents of the virtues of very large American fruits and vegetables, superior to their European counterparts. In 1825, Jefferson, who was then in his 80s, read in the Cleveland Herald that an Ohio farmer had grown a cucumber well over a meter long, and he wrote to the governor of Ohio, uh, and he said in his letter, although giants do not always beget giants, yet I should count on their improving the breed. And he got some seeds. He distributed the seeds. He was, uh, this was just a less than, fewer than six months before his, his death. He distributed the seeds. Um, they were planted. Uh, the rector of Charlottesville's, uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, where, uh, near where Jefferson lived, of uh, Christ Church, Frederick Hatch, he produced an 88, 2.2 meter long cucumber from the Monticello seeds a few years after his death. And this uh, cucumber uh, here, this is a, a contemporary cucumber uh, grown from descendants of the same, the same seeds. James Madison at Montpelier in Orange County, Virginia, grew a giant beetroot species from France that he had coveted and, and gotten. And it, he grew it in a greenhouse on his property. Uh, in spite of himself being quite a diminutive fellow, he was about 1.6 meters tall. Um, this revelation about Madison's size made me yearn for the days when our vegetables were huge and the pol politicians were small. <laughs> so it, it is in our nature to admire and to desire what is grown for food. When did we begin to distrust so much of it? And how and when did Jefferson's ideal cucumber become vegetable awful? In the late 19th and early 20th century, American State Fair celebrated farming and established a tradition of honoring the growers of large vegetables and fruits. And today, Alaska leads the rest of the United States in growing big produce, and the annual State Fair is a showcase for huge vegetables. This was, you know, there are lots of states that have state fairs, and a lot of states still uh, have their, you know, the largest pumpkin, but no state comes close to Alaska. What's going on in Alaska is truly extraordinary. Uh, on the right is Scott Robb. Scott Robb is uh, 
is the, is the champion Alaska grower of enormous vegetables. This is one of his cabbages from a few years back. It is a beautiful cabbage, um, but it will only be eaten by bears and elk because all of the giant vegetables from the Alaska Fair are considered fit only for animals and they are taken to an injured wildlife preserve and, and uh, fed, fed to the bears and, and, uh, and whatnot. On the left, I wanted to include this by way of comparison. This is from the Tecunium sanitaeus. Uh, this is a cabbage also, um, and it's depicted as a, you know, it's a wholesome thing. It's a, it's a uh, um, I guess, a, uh, definitely healthy but very large, and it certainly violated the, the modern rule of not eating anything larger than your head. Uh, another example I think I uh, like of, of, uh, of, this, of this sort of shift in standards, uh, all, of the, all of the vegetables in, in these two pictures would be considered by contemporary standards uh, awful. On the left, uh, the squash that uh, the Native American woman is holding um, this is a contemporary picture also, but uh, it's about a half a meter long. It's a bright orange squash. It's a variety called Geta Cosmin. Um, and the variety actually was thought to be extinct. It's grown by, it was, it was grown by Native Americans. Um, they think that, uh, that, that this uh, variety may be 2,000 years old. It's a very, very old uh, variety. And it's part of a program uh, in the Great Lakes region of the United States to uh, bring back traditional, to grow traditional crops um, as a revival of, of foods native to that area. So this was grown as food. This was, this was not a prize winner decorative. This was food. But on the right, you have an Alaska grower, another Alaska grower, Brittany Kaufman, holding two zucchinis. Uh, that she entered in the 2013 uh, competition in Alaska. They're prize winners, but they are not food. So I think this is an, an example of how understandings about large vegetables have changed dramatically. The squash on the left was grown for food. The one on the right for something else. In the United States, I think it is actually possible to put a date on the beginning of the shift in thought about what characteristics make produce desirable as food, and that is the imposition of standards. Um, these, uh, uh, when wheat standards were first proposed by the Chicago Board of Trade in 1856, and they were proposed as a solution to the problem of mixing the grain from different owners in the same bin. William Cronin, in his wonderful book, Nature's Metropolis, wrote about this. Um, and he said the grading system allowed elevators, grain elevators, to sever the link between ownership rights and physical grain with a host of unanticipated consequences. Um, I, I included these illustrations, these beautiful illustrations, because these are all varieties of wheat that were growing. These were, these were just varieties growing in New York around the time of the imposition of standards. And I, I don't know if you can tell, if you can see, but very, very different varieties. Uh, I mean, they're, you know, they were all grown for food. Um, and, uh, but, but things changed when, there, when standards were imposed. Um, and uh, these, you know, it was done for uh, purposes of commerce. I mean, it, it aided commerce, but there were uh, consequences. And the wheat standards led to standards for other fruits and vegetables. In fact, now there are standards for virtually every fruit and vegetable grown in the United States, and these standards are handed down by the United States Department of Agriculture. On the left is a, a U USDA uh, guide to strawberries, and on the right uh, is Carl Grooms holding a perfect strawberry from his Plant City, Florida farm. Um, Carl Grooms is a commercial strawberry farmer. Uh, there are a cluster of commercial strawberry farms in Plant City, Florida. If you eat a strawberry in the northeast of the United States between Thanksgiving and roughly the end of January, you are probably eating a Plant City strawberry. And they are, um, uh, they're, you know, that berry that he is holding is, is the U.S. number one perfect berry 
and all of these others, if, he gets, if anything in his field grows that looks like any of those, it will not even be harvested. He, um, the, uh, the, this, is, this is part of the unintended consequences of the USDA standards. The USDA standards are completely voluntary, um, which, but they define quality by size, by shape, by appearance, but they do not define it by flavor or nutrition. And they're not, it's not only that the food goes to waste if it doesn't conform, it's that the standards actually deform agricultural practices, seed development, uh, and the entire agricultural uh, supply chain. He adheres to the, the, the top grade. He wants US, only US number one because he has to. He can't sell them otherwise. And this is not just true of commercial, uh, of commercial farmers. This is a berry from um, uh, the Kent family farm. This is a uh, diversified organic farm in the St. Lawrence River Valley in upstate New York. Uh, this is Megan Kent uh, is holding her, her, her berry. No way she can sell that. She sells direct to customers. She sells direct through a CSA, through a farm stand. But she told me most people don't want large anything. They, they don't want huge cabbages, they don't want squash, lettuce, peas, cucumbers, root vegetables. These things, if they are large, instill distrust or outright aversion in, in customers. And you know, having been one of those averse customers, I, I, I hear her. Um, these strawberries are um, farm stand berries, and the superior taste and flavor of farm stand berries uh, really has more to do with freshness and ripeness than with size. It's made farm stand strawberries into a luxury food. Most consumers consider, it, consider them superior to berries purchased in a grocery store. But even a farm stand berry will not sell if it's misshapen and lumpy, no matter how shiny its skin. And shininess in a berry, these are very, very shiny berries, and they were really good. Shininess is, is a characteristic of a delicious berry. Uh, lumpiness it is not. These were grown by Wickham's Fruit Farm. Uh, it's a farm in South Hold, New York. It's actually one of the oldest farms in North America. So we have now entered a very interesting period in vegetable aesthetics. The identification of food waste as a global problem was highlighted by the European Union announcement in 2014 that it was the year against food waste. This increased awareness and it resulted in a lot of retail initiatives in Europe and North America to curb food waste by selling vegetable offal through retail outlets like Waitrose, uh, Tesco, Intermarché sells uh, ugly vegetables, there's a, there Italy, Portugal and Canada, blah blah. In the US, Whole Foods, Imperfect Produce is a, is a, is a, C, a basically a CSA that does it in, uh, in the Bay Area and Trader Joe's. All of these are large retail operations that, that, that now trade in imperfect vegetables. Suddenly, imperfect vegetables and fruits are stylish. They are on trend. This is Gwyneth Paltrow's photograph of twisty carrots from Vogue mas magazine. It is a beautiful luxury item. So, let me ask you, would you call these apples blighted or are they breakfast? Would you care to eat this tomato? Yeah, well, you guys probably would. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of people here who just ate smoked, you know, horse tongue. So I, you know, all right, whatever. Um, the, uh, so Jeffrey Pilcher wrote recently, I thought this was a very, I, I, like, I like this a lot in the uh, American Historical Review. He said, food conveys powerful ideological messages because of its seemingly natural place in human life. And seemingly is the operative word here. Um, fruits and vegetables seem to be a product of nature, but they are the result of human design and manipulation from seed to root to fruit. And um, I think that we are born with overall very favorable feelings toward fruits and vegetables, unlike meat, which is a, you know, more, more complex, but, but fruits and vegetables um, we perceive them as food and we perceive them as natural. But the distance that's imposed between the consumer and the farm by commercial agriculture 
deforms notions of vegetable beauty. We, you know, there are a lot of people who really never see anything other than a perfect strawberry or a perfect tomato. And uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a distance that's, that's not uh, necessarily a helpful thing. Consumers worry about the flavor, the texture, the purity, and the nutrition of imperfect fruits and vegetables. But the standards have nothing to do with perfection, uh, with the flavor, taste, or nutrition. In fact, there is some evidence that nutrition is better in, in stressed or ugly vegetables. Um, so this, so the, these two factors, distance and standards, I think, are, uh, are, are uh, go a ways toward explaining um, contemporary uh, feelings about ugly and uh, large vegetables. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming in. Um, as Martin said, I recently graduated from Hamilton College. Um, and for my senior thesis for my environmental studies major, I decided to look at food waste at my now alma mater, Hamilton College. Um, I, I guess I became sort of this food waste girl because, <laughs> amongst my peers because I became very obsessed with this topic. Um, even from day one when I first entered college, I noticed that a lot of students were leaving more plates with food left behind than plates without food. Um, so when I was looking at this, every day I would enter the dining halls and I would think, why are people wasting so much food? You know, how much are we wasting on a regular basis and are we doing anything to reduce that waste? So I want to share some of the answers that I found to these questions with you today. Um, and then I'd like to kind of, um, I guess, share lessons and some takeaways, especially for you in the audience who are still in education. If you know someone who's in undergrad or still in college, or perhaps if you are a professor, um, some things might be worth noting. Um, in the end, I would like to show, um, I guess, a short documentary that I created at the end of my research. Um, I had a very unique opportunity to have an art focus as an environmental studies major, and that um, I decided to just create a film uh, related to this topic. Um, so first, I'd like to kind of give a background about Hamilton College. Um, it's a very obs like obscure, small, uh, liberal arts college that's found in the middle of the state of New York. Um, it's characterized, I think, uh, by its small student to professor ratio. Um, our student population is roughly about 1,850 students, very small. Um, it's also found in the middle of nowhere. We like to joke that you know, everything that we need is on campus because we have nothing to go to around us. <laughs> um, but uh, it's also, ha it also has a lot of students who are very ambitious and motivated and there are a lot of student organizations and leadership opportunities. Um, also in terms of food, we have two main dining halls, one pub, yes we do have a pub. Um, we also have a diner and three cafes but most of us ate um, or eat at the dining halls because we're kind of forced to be on a meal plan um, and it's also helpful because there aren't that much uh, places to go eat as students around us. Um, and I think there are many benefits of having lived on a small campus. Uh, first, there's a very strong community where you're surrounded by people who love Hamilton, who love being part of the school community and who want to talk to you. Um, there are also many benefits in terms of research. Um, especially when you, when you want to do research that is about the school, uh, you can really meet people and talk to people who want to talk to you and share their kind of uh, information, give you stories and anecdotes. Um, so for my research, I use a lot of anecdotes and empirical data. Um, so that involved doing a lot of interviews with students, faculty, and staff members, particularly from the grounds crew and the dining hall staff. Um, so through these interviews, um, I, I guess I'd like to share some of the data that I collected. Um, and first, uh, what I wanted to figure out was how much were we wasting on a regular basis? You know, our foods, uh, we take our, our plates from the dining hall. You know, we have a very, you know, nice buffet set up. You take your food. When you're done, you put it on this conveyor belt. And this is a photo of the conveyor belt that we have in our dish room um, at our largest dining hall. So a student co uh, conducted a waste audit and she found out that um, on an average dinner, we are wasting about 36.4 kilograms of food. And that's all of the food that students are leaving behind on their plates. How many students is, is eating that now? Uh, I think I wrote down about, well, the thing is, so the, the waste audit, this is kind of a, to backtrack, um, to give you a bit more information. Originally, the girl, she did a five-night waste audit. In total, I think about 
4,000 people were calculated as entering, um, and then you know divide all of that, and eventually I got this number. Um, it doesn't give you the facts about how much we're wasting during lunch, breakfast, or the other dining halls, but it gives you kind of an idea of how much we're typically wasting. Um, and from these observations, you know, as I'm watching people leave plates with food on them, I have, I've, you know, as I hear people talk, um, the trends that I've been finding is that people are wasting food mostly due to taste. They don't like what they're eating, but they kind of have to eat it because that's all they're being offered. So if you don't like their food, they're going to leave that, that food behind. Um, second, it's portioning. You know, we get a lot of food, and unless you tell your server that you want less, you might be getting more than you want, so you kind of leave it on your plate. Uh, third, it, as I said, we do have a buffet set up, so when you have all of that variety, you kind of get encouraged sometimes unknowingly to take more food than you often can finish, and then that becomes waste. Um, and fourth, it's something I think very relevant to student life. You know, we're very busy, we want to get from class to take a quick bite, but if you took a lot of food or if you got too much food, then that inevitably becomes waste as well. Um, but despite all of this, you know, we are doing our part to reduce some of that waste in certain fashions. For example, we do actually have a composting system on campus. Um, our grounds crew and our dining hall staff work together to collect pre- and post-consumer waste. This comes from the dish rooms and also from these uh, conveyor belts there are uh, staff who scrape all the, all the food into uh, bins that are then dumped. Um, and all of that waste, all that food is collected and transported to a local farm called Crane Farm. And the local farmer, he does use that on his fields as fertilizer. Uh, so this is great. And there's another example of composting. Uh, there's this very unique, I think Hamilton is very unique in that it has this kind of alternative, uh, almost you know, cliche, like hippie-ish style you know, dormitory where students uh, cook with local and organic foods and then they live and eat as a community within that dormitory. And all that food that is left behind or any all the food scraps, those are then composted um, those are all sent to our community garden, which is just a few hundred feet away from the dormitory. Um, so these are just two examples of how we're using uh, food waste in alternative ways. Um, a third is related to food donations. Um, we actually have three student organizations that collect uh, package leftover food, mostly from our large dining hall, which is where you know, this dish room is from. Uh, we package that food, and each organization you know, on average per week, pack about 20 to 25 meals. And those are then collected and frozen and transported to local senior centers and food banks in the area. Um, so mostly in the, in the city of Utica, New York, um, as well as Clinton. Um, so you might be hearing as you hear all this information, um, you know, yes, we, uh, I forgot to give you this one fact, uh, we are composting actually about 123.5 tons, uh, metric tons of food each year. Um, and when you hear this, you might be thinking, wow, Hamilton is doing an incredible job. You know, they have composting, they have food packaging. You might be thinking we're very progressive, but I would say yes, but also no. You know, it's great that we have all of these systems in place, um, but I don't think we should be completely relying on these systems. I think what's still lacking is the fact that students aren't as aware of what is going on. I think the school should be doing a better job of promoting that and getting really student commitment towards these practices. Um, and I think what's still lacking for me, and I do talk more about, you know, moral obligation of kind of thinking more uh, intensely about, you know, reducing food um, in my paper, but that's something that I really do think is missing, um, this kind of thinking where we should be thinking about reducing food on an everyday basis, thinking it of an everyday obligation. Um, so, Despite all of these kind of, uh, I don't know how to categorize this, but not exactly like an eth ethical glitch where people aren't thinking of it in terms of morality, um, I do think that there are certain things that are in place at Hamilton. There are certain structures that are in place um, that are worth kind of transporting and uh, kind of sharing with other colleges. Um, and I think, like Hamilton, um, I think schools would do a better job at promoting less wasteful behavior at their schools. Um, if, uh, if they're willing, ready, and of course, you know, financially capable of doing so, if they provide the appropriate kind of uh, structures and learning resources for their students to become less wasteful um, and start really thinking of waste as more of the beginning of a food cycle rather than the end, as we kind of are typically told. 
Um, so I think there are four resources that kind of come to mind you know, at the end of my research. And I think these are some of the takeaways that some of you who are, who are in education can kind of reflect on. Um, so first, I think it's really important to have a community garden. Um, community gardens are a great way for people to get in touch with soil, really see the food cycle kind of physically transform in front of you. It's also a place where professors can bring their students and you know, especially if you are in sciences, even arts, um, even sociology, anthropology, whatever, I think you can find a way to kind of make food waste become a cross-disciplinary topic um, and use you know, the uh, community garden as your field research site. Um, I also do think that um, composting should exist you know, everywhere. If it doesn't already, you should also promote it a bit better. Um, but I think you know, Hamilton doesn't involve students in the composting system except for at the co-op, uh, that one dormitory I told you about. Uh, but I think if you start getting students to start, you know, uh, I guess dividing the food themselves, uh, they'll start really seeing that this is something we should be thinking about consciously every day. Um, third, I think the classroom is almost obviously, but it should be a better learning resource for, you know, promoting less wasteful behavior. Um, I think professors, if they haven't already, again, should start involving food in their topics. So for instance, you know, I took a class called Food and Philosophy. I were very fortunate that in a small liberal arts school, we have all these obscure classes like that. Um, but it really gets you know, the wheels turning in your head thinking, wow, I really need to take a step back and think about food more seriously, um, you know, et cetera. Um, and finally, I, I, as I mentioned with the co-op, that alternative dormitory, it's something I think that other schools similar to Hamilton in size definitely should start considering. Um, it is kind of <laughs> stereotypical, as I said, in the way that it might promote kind of hippie-ish attitudes, but you do find a lot of people who aren't building into that stereotype at all. Um, they're really getting hands-on uh, interaction with food and seeing it from their kitchens into the field and back again because some of the uh, produce that's grown in the fields are, come, um, are returned back into the kitchen. Um, and again, I know re I realize that this is a very Hamilton college-focused research, but I do think that it's important to target colleges and university students because college is definitely a time when people start learning about their passions. Uh, they start really thinking about the world's problems in a more critical light. Um, so I think it's important to start encouraging that kind of less wasteful behavior very early on, um, but not even early on, right? As we're still young adults, we're in the, we still have time eventually, and maybe even thinking about uh, going into the lower education could be beneficial too, but college is, again, as I said, time when you're thinking critically about problems uh, like food waste. Um, so I do think that schools have a sort of obligation to uh, really get students to graduate uh, thinking more ethically and sustainably because it really would be a waste of an education to not have your students kind of graduate with that kind of progressive mindset. Um, and I think it's somewhat idealistic to kind of hope that everyone would you know, become very conscious about environmental issues, food issues, agriculture, et cetera. But you'd be surprised that, you know, if you provide the right resources for your students, people can get very motivated. Um, and I think there's a great example that can be found in uh, a friend of mine um, named Kirsten Kampmeyer, who was actually the star of my, uh, star of my short documentary. Um, she's originally from uh, Austin, yes, Austin, Texas, which is in the south of US. Um, she grew up eating a lot of junk food, you know, sodas, but after just literally just one year at Hamilton, uh, she got involved in the community garden. She took a class on uh, environmental ethics, a class called Food for Thought. Um, and she started joining clubs like Slow Food. We have a ch chapter of Slow Food at our school, you know, getting really involved um, kind of unknowingly that, you know, this entire food world existed. She became sort of converted and she became something that I think is uh, an ideal of what I would like Hamilton and other college students to graduate as thinking more consciously about uh, food and their life in total. So she has a very beautiful lifestyle um, that I would like to kind of share with you. Um, I guess I'll just kind of play the film and if we do have questions I can answer them afterwards but I'll just go from here. Yeah. Oh that's not the bird I thought it was. What are you? Yes, it is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I want new birds.
I think it's very complex, uh, the relationship that the farm has with anything on campus. Because a farm, especially the kind of farm we have, is incredibly complex because it's community focused. You have to produce a product, which isn't really something any other organization or thing on campus really has to do. People work there and are paid, it's managed by physical plant now. And although the co-op buys food from them, there is no like inherent obligation either to do that or to put in any time on the farm. Obviously, ideally, within the co-op, within any sustainable living situation, you want to close the cycle. You just want to have a completely closed cycle where like everything is within your system and you don't need to go out and get anything else. When you're all like dependent on each other and know where everything's coming from and a part of everything, which is a really hard thing to do, especially in upstate New York because the growing seasons are so short that it's really hard to eat locally and seasonally. So even with the farm, just to get food from the farm into the co-op, you have to plan ahead and tell the farmers how much you're going to need and then they have to go out and harvest that and then bring it into the co-op. And then there's a whole passing over of money because we deal with money in this world. Um, so it's not as simple and beautiful as just kind of going down to the farm and picking your veggies and coming back and eating them. But it, it is definitely a good example of how it could be closed off, how you could have this closed system that really works. But we're really just like putting our foot into that. We're not by any means near closing the cycle, but it is good for everyone in the co-op and the farm to see that that's a possibility. And with composting, obviously, that's sort of the end of the cycle is you grow the food, you eat the food, whatever is left over from the food, you throw in the compost, you use the organic material from the compost back on the farm, and you got that cycle. So I think it's important that people understand that and can see it because people always feel more connected when they can see it and are a part of it. But it's definitely not at that point at all where it's like we could rely on the farm for our food and like we don't need anyone, you know, we're nowhere near that. But it's a good example of what it could look like. We built an igloo in the common room once. It's kind of like the Egglu represents the co-op as a whole because it's a place where you go in and like immediately start having important conversations that you don't have elsewhere. So it's sort of like a co-op within the co-op, just like an even safer space within a safe place. Just like weird ways of acknowledging friendship. It's pretty beautiful here. The co-op so many different things to different people and in different moments, but I guess it's mostly people looking for a different sort of living situation. So people who want to be with people living around shared food values and community values. Yes, you're making mayonnaise? Yes. Okay. I'm trying to think of what's going on. can be very hard to uphold and you kind of have to let things slide sometimes because you got to eat and if someone buys something you're not gonna you know they went out like out of their way to go buy food so we could cook dinner and you're not going to be like oh no you need to go return those avocados because avocados don't grow in upstate New York ever <laughs> um, because you know there's there's good intentions there so I think if I if I didn't believe that everyone in here was thoughtful and like trying It'd be a lot harder to live here, but I know everyone here thinks so intensely about life and like their communications with other humans and with the world that it, for me it's become a lot more about the people than the food. I think I knew that coming in, but I definitely came in being like, this is about me living ethically and sustainably, and I, can't, I definitely can't do that anywhere else on campus. And it's hard to even do it here, so <laughs> it's definitely more about the people now. Pretty much see everything we've eaten the past like three weeks. With everything, nothing's gonna decompose with it this cold. Is that a glow?
love? Not, no. <laughs> what the hell? Is there another glove? <laughs> Kind of decomposable. I'm actually just looking for gloves now. <laughs> I think we're good. From what I've seen of what past years have done in terms of compost and in terms of the co-op, is like you can have all the best intentions. Like I, have, I was very much like so excited to start my compost down there um, and like set it up really nicely and was like flipping it every day. But then like upstate New York, it's just sort of like well, one day it snowed all over it and then it was all really moist and soggy and like didn't really want to flip it every day when I had to like walk down in like a snowstorm. And like a few weeks ago, it was covered in bees and I was like that that's not worth it, you know. Um, and I know at the farm. We've tried composting stuff from the farm before too, but it's really easy for it to get diseases or to get like weed seed in it, and then your compost is pretty much useless if you can't get it to a certain temperature that like destroys the weed seed. Which by no means means you shouldn't try. It just means like you should go in with the best intentions and be very prepared to like have your dreams of composting shattered because it's not <laughs> simple. Because <laughs> nothing's simple. <laughs> Farming for me was the easiest way to like help as many people as possible like achieve their own dreams because everyone everyone has to eat. I think most people don't really think about that as a part of achieving your dreams or like your goals in life. But it's the simplest way that I can be a part of that in as many people as possible, just by like feeding people and like taking that sort of out of the way for them to like do whatever it is they want to do and it like lines up because that is my dream so it just like works out nicely for me but having that be recognized and that you as a person can't exist without like this farmer or without the food or without the soil and just kind of like if you have to just start with like the human to human connection that's great and is a really great place to start so like being like this is my dream and the only way I can get there is because this farmer is like growing my food so like I need to thank them or like being like this is my mom like I love my mom the only way that my mom exists is because like someone's like feeding her via food and like that's beautiful so like I gotta thank that farmer. I think once you get to the farmer you'd realize that that farmer's just like oh well the only reason I can do this is like because of the food you know like the, it's the thing growing like I'm just trying to help it along but like I'm not really doing anything I'm just lucky. Um, and then like going even further and then it's like well the food would be like oh thank you soil like you're so helpful and the soil would be like thank you water you're great like wow water. You know, just like keep on going and just kind of being like embracing that every time you eat and are like trying to like reach your goal or your dream or whatever that it's like way more complex doing your part as an individual is like not simplifying something that's necessary to life and just like really understanding what's helping you get to wherever it is you want to go and I think because food is something that's helping everyone people are scared to dive into it like that but I think once you do then eating and food suddenly become like an interesting part of your life rather than just something you do. Everybody, the college is everybody, 
has to compost their stuff, and then it goes to a place where it's made into compost, and then it's sold. So if the city can take charge, the universities don't need to do it. it it's just a one, it's just a con, it's just an idea. Yeah, so I mean. A very efficient way of composting. So when I was talking to the grounds crew, I think sometime in the 90s, they, uh, Hamilton worked with Cornell, and they tried to, you know, in the state of New York, um, it's very difficult to kind of find uh, farmers who are willing to take your compost because all our trash goes to a landfill um, that doesn't compost our, our, you know, food waste. So that's why we had to kind of work with uh, Cornell, which has a great program, and, you know, try to find a way for us to kind of become more uh, efficient with that. And Oregon is a part of this politically acceptable. This is yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's just, uh, and it takes big chunks out of individual obligations to have the combo. You have to do it because you drive from and picked up. Toronto does it too. Yeah. We have a question here, there, and there, so we'll go in this direction. Okay. So, uh, so, so I was wondering if you, in your interviews with the students, if you looked at like early childhood, because it seems like how much people even have played maybe a function of how they've been raised. Yeah, I mean, for myself, that was a huge factor. Um, I, was, I was told growing up to clean everything on my plate. Uh, that's just how my family grew up and how I kind of lived my lifestyle. But the reason why I didn't actually look at that angle was because um, when you start looking at how people grow, grew up, and I did ask people, you know, did your parents tell you to clean your plate? There are some people who said yes. Um, in particular with faculty, you know, people, they're of an older generation, so they're used to being um, kind of instructed, you know, to clean their plate as well. Um, but I didn't, I didn't include that in my paper just because I thought, you know, when you think of that, there are other kind of psychological things that come into play, and that was hard for me to quantify and make more, uh, I don't know, uh, representative. Uh, it's not, it's, I, I guess I'm kind of um, crossing my, you know, words and such, but I, I just don't include <coughs> that because I think it's different for everybody, um, and it's it's just like too much information to include in just this piece. But you know, just in conversations that did come up, though. Yeah, and the other thing was, did you look at how much food was produced but not served that also went to landfill, or was so that the, re the the cafeteria is producing X mm -hmm. amount of food, some of it is consumed, some some of it goes to the students' plates, mm -hmm. they eat it, some does it, some winds up in the landfill that way but also they generally produce more than is, is given out, and a lot of that goes to waste also. So it yeah. gets packaged and, and frozen for those meals. Right. Yeah, so uh, the... Th sometimes uh, it doesn't all come here, like partial hotel pans and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean the food that, because uh, the way our school operates is that the catering company uh, cooks in smaller batches, so they do call down to the kitchens and tell them to uh, cook, which is, you know, uh, so, you know, Bon Appetit Company, they're trying to do a good job, but... We're going to take a question no, there. No, no, yeah. Time, All right, would you take a quick question? What? Well, just a quick question was sure. that um, children growing up in all the westernized world for the last uh, 20 to 30 years have had recycling slash composting education as part of their primary and secondary schools, yet coming to college they are quite wasteful as you found. Mm -hmm. From your own research and the movie you just uh, showed, what were the things at college that people were doing to actually change those behaviors? What were the best things that college was doing? Is the to, to change, to become to change. less... For instead of all this stuff that we're doing in primary and secondary school that isn't working because we're obviously wasteful generation, yeah. what, is, what are the actual things that are changing and what are the best things? I, okay, I'm going to try to answer that very quickly. Yeah, um, it's a hard question. <laughs> so, uh, at least just in terms of like my own school, because as I said, we do have all this, all this food, and at least growing up in elementary school, when you bought school, uh, or when you bought lunch at school, you were only given a small portion each time you always had like a very small portion. And I think I saw, I can't really say now as I'm older, <laughs> but I feel like people, you know, ate all of that more, whereas you just have much, way, way more abundance here. So there's um, structural things as well as education. I think so, yeah. Yeah, we'll the short of it. The final question here before we finish up. Two points. The, just for me to better understand, the about 40 kilos waste that you mentioned, that was only in one bag at home? Yes. Okay, because, um, but when you're talking about 123 tons that were composted. That was a year. That wow. makes about four, 340 kilos per day in the college. Yes. Which is really a lot. Mm -hmm. So, and the other point was, if you somehow include the pricing of the food, 
Was it, is it subsidized by, by the college, the, the, the price that students pay? Because very often um, we realize that things that are not properly priced are not um, valued. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so being, we have to be part of a meal plan, and set, it goes by seven meals a week, 14 to 21. It's also very expensive, um, and most people are on the larger meal plans. Um, <coughs> I didn't look at the costs of the food and how that's kind of wasted. The only things that where costs came into play was uh, the cost of throwing the food out um, in a landfill versus actually having it composted. And again, we only compost from the two main dining halls. So that doesn't even quantify anything coming from the pub, the diner, or the cafes. Um, but the, when I talked to the grounds crew, he did all the calculations based on the uh, facts that he got from the past few years, those composting data, and he found that, um, I don't have the figure on hand, I forget, but he, per ton, there is still a bit of savings um, when we compost versus sending that food to the landfill. So that's but just our own school. Uh, so that's the question, again. you pay for a meal plan, so it, and it's, it's all you can eat each meal. Now okay. it's, it's true, probably, that you had to pay for your, each meal. You would not eat as much, each right. item. OK, well, I'd like uh, a round of applause. I think that was a wonderful <laughs> Hiya. Um, as Mike uh, said, I'm a chef, and my paper is mainly a description of my own attempts as a chef to deal creatively with the waste products which are largely, but not exclusively, what we might call vegetable offal, so stalks and peelings and so forth, that a commercial kitchen generates. It struck me in the months since preparing the paper that the situation I describe is really quite a privileged one. So it's that I wanted to talk about, rather than speaking directly to my paper, which I'm sure everyone's read thoroughly and eagerly <laughs> anyway. I'm a chef at a small cafe attached to a kitchen garden with quite a generally adventurous and interested clientele. So my perspective, I think, on food waste and offal is necessarily somewhat skewed, perhaps, compared to most people. I can afford, essentially, to be optimistic about it. Occasionally at the cafe, we source whole animals from local smallholders, which allows us to buy cheaply for much greater returns. Not a scrap of the animal will be wasted. We grind down the fat and stuff for sausages. We make salamis. We use the bones for stock, everything. We end up with a variety of premium products, to which words like unique or artisan and so forth could be applied. So it's quite a win-win situation. We have these hams and salamis and stuff, which last a good part of the year and which essentially no one else has. So all that's required to do that is a fairly large investment of skill, space and, of course, time. More usually, throughout the rest of the year, and possibly more relevantly to the average consumer, we get our meat from a local butcher who combines the not, unfortunately, universal traits of acquiring good meat and then doing skillful things to it. Knowing, perhaps, the tight financial margins which we run as a small cafe, he uh, is always ready to cut us the odder, cheaper bits of meat, such as hanger and underblade steaks, as well as giving us pieces like heart and trotter completely for free. He always seems happy to do that. In fact, seems genuinely interested in what we do with all the odd bits and pieces. I think most butchers are quite interested in meat and organ meat and what people actually end up doing with them. The fact is he couldn't survive on this sort of custom alone, just as the idea of offal requires prime cuts to sort of define itself against. So he needs to sell prime cuts in order to give us the cheap bits. Mm. If everybody turned to the cheap bits, then not only would they cease to be cheap, they'd cease really to be offal. Positions would reverse, and the economic and ethical imperative would just be to eat endless fillet. This, stress again, this very privileged situation attains and only because of a wider community of consumers that we at the cafe are part of. There are the customers there at the cafe who are willing to pay for and to eat a variety of different cuts and organs. There are the staff at the cafe and in the gardens who can process offcuts and compost into something edible or at least useful. More widely, there are the unknown other customers of our butcher who allow him to, con to continue to operate in an ethical and high-quality way and still make enough money to survive, and so on and so forth. So when we cook with offal, with meat or fish or vegetable waste products, we're engaging, really, with a wider world. And if the consumption of offal is to be anything other than performative and elitist, I think it's important, really, to bear that in mind. It's clear, from a professional perspective, that the food systems that we work with, with the suppliers we work with, from farm to fridge are dysfunctional, with waste not the unfortunate byproduct, which that word should suggest, but built into the warp and the weft of them. If we want the round-the-clock convenience and the kind of mindless worship of freshness which supermarkets and which large-scale wholesalers provide, then waste is the inevitable consequence. 
everything is freely available all of the time, then some of it goes off. That's obviously just what happens. Once you begin to accept that, though, you lose sight of the value, the nutritive value, the financial value, or the social value inherent in each individual piece of food. Currently, I think, a model prevails where, because food is bought too cheap, it is esteemed far too lightly. Farmers at the mercy of large buyers are forced to sell their goods at less than the cost of production. This happens most famously with milk. Uh, well, at the other end of the supply chain, we throw away those half pints of milk because they're past their best. We throw away bags of wilted salad. We throw away reduced meat, eggs, which we think have gone off. It's easy to blame individual consumers for this, I think, but what else really can you do if that's how you're educated about food waste, it's just the numbers on a packet? There's no network, really, to distribute waste, and few of the people have few of the skills to make the best of it. The community that we have in a commercial kitchen to wring the most out of all our materials needs, really, I think, a parallel in the domestic sphere. My mum volunteers in a day centre for homeless people, cooking a daily meal for a not insignificant community, many of whom, incidentally, are in themselves victims of the war for ever cheaper food, often Eastern European migrants brought here on a promise of year-round farm work. They find themselves, after the harvest, often jobless, often passportless and homeless, with several, for example, who are living inside a large shipping container, one of those large metal boxes. Um, <clears throat> the food that the day centre feeds to these people is, of course, largely donations of waste. A lot of the meat comes, for example, from Nando's, where their practice of pre-cooking and hot-holding chicken for each service means they have huge amounts of leftovers, which are promptly frozen and then redistributed to these different centres. Good for Nando's. It would be a mistake to think, though, that only chains and uh, chain restaurants and supermarkets produce this kind of waste, I think. A local, for example, a local farmer's market, I think I'm right in saying, is one of their largest or one of their chief donors providing good stale bread, stale sourdough and stuff, and boxes of softening heritage vegetables. So alongside the Nando's chicken, you have purple potatoes and mixed carrots and so forth. So more responsible food businesses, as you suppose a farmer's market would be, aren't immune from waste. In fact, as I kind of mentioned in my paper, they're often more likely to produce more because the more raw materials you waste with the clothes, the you work with, sorry, the closer you work with producers, the more waste you're likely to get out of that. Uh, so you're likely to produce more. But placing a far higher value on the raw materials that they work with, I think they're far more likely to want to do something about it. Or so, so you'd hope. <coughs> I'm quite wary, because the cafe I work at is kind of mid-high end, I'm quite wary of accusations of elitism in this kind of use of waste, this kind of repurposing of waste. I don't think, as some people seem to, that creating a zero-waste, fully sustainable farm-to-fork restaurant that has a $250 tasting menu is particularly laudable. It's impressive, perhaps admirable, compared to other similar restaurants, but only in the way that it might be admirable to say carbon offset a completely pointless long-haul flight. You probably shouldn't have made the flight in the first place, but it's good that you're doing something about it. If what you're doing is essentially useless, sustainability should be a bare minimum. But um, as all restaurants really are basically useless, I suppose it's something that needs addressing by all restaurants. No one needs to eat out, ever, really. Um, <clears throat> there's an unexamined idea, I think, behind a lot of the farm to fork movement that in some not long ago golden age, when everybody lived off the land, the people enjoyed this kind of year-round diet, fresh fruit, vegetables and salads, which is, of course, complete nonsense, requiring huge amounts of labour and land to bring to fruition, which is why these restaurants end up massively expensive, elite feeding places. They foster a community of farmers and butchers and bakers and cooks, but they only do so really for the very richest in society who can afford it. I'm not a food historian, except in a very amateur way. But I know that a more accurate picture of sustainable peasant living would include, apart from long periods of disease or starvation, a huge repertoire of methods for storing food, not for this constant kind of harvesting, harvesting, harvesting. They would have things to last the winter. The fleeting moments of freshness in spring and summer and the rich harvests of autumn would just be the start of a lengthy process to ensure enough nutrition to last through the long dark that would be the rest of the year. Despite our recent embrace of an idyllic kind of Mediterranean diet in this country, which I think is where a lot of the kind of worship of these fresh things comes from, we are, of course, essentially a northern European country. And when considering how to, <coughs> how to deal with waste, how to get the most of the limited resources we have, it's other such countries that I often look for culinary inspiration. So that's why 
<coughs> looking for ways to deal with the waste we generate in the cafe, both in terms of seasonal gluts, which is going to be hard to find a market for, and the vegetable offal of peel, stalks, outer leaves and so on, I turn to pickling, the tradition of pickling. The British tradition of vinegar pickling, both in clear pickles and in chutneys, is an essentially static one, where some of the best or most abundant seasonal produce is preserved, kind of as it were, in amber, just perfectly as it was. A good pickled onion, for example, needs to start out as a very good onion, otherwise you're just going to end up with something not particularly pleasant. The fermentation of vegetables, on the other hand, which is practiced over most of the rest of the world, including all of Northern Europe, pretty much, with things like sauerkraut, with dill pickles, and throughout Southeast Asia, that most other food cultures I really know much about. It's a fully transformative process, comparable in its effect on texture to long, slow cooking, and it's in development of flavor to almost nothing else. I think you end up with this incredible, kind of deep umami flavor from, from <coughs> fermentation. So, I think it's an ideal thing to do to what, to the vegetable offal that we have. You're much more likely, certainly you are, to get hold of a whole head of broccoli than you are a whole pig, ever. So, being so much smaller, you're much more able as an individual to deal with the whole thing as well. The community required to make the most of the produce shrinks, but it's still there. You still need a grower, a seller, a consumer. You still need the skills, importantly, to deal with it, and a willing community of eaters. This latter, I think, is there all growing. There's a growing popularity for fermentation, for things like kimchi, particularly, I think. It shows that Britain's finally acquiring a taste for that sour bacterial tang, which most of the rest of the world is so used to. And the skills, I guess, when having acquired the taste, the skills to get there will come. There's, for example, there's a Brighton-based project called Octopus Alchemy, I don't know if anyone's heard of it, um, which runs workshops to teach these skills, intercepting food waste in much the same way that the Oxford Food Bank does, and turning it into various ferments. I know there's similar business in Wales, London and Staffordshire, and I'm sure there's more across the country. The fact is, though, that you don't really need these workshops. It's both easy and cheap to do, more so in my experience, than pickling with vinegar or making chutney. And it's also, we're told, much better for you. So I'm a chef, I'm not a nutritionist, I'm not particularly qualified to comment on that. Um, <clears throat> but more than the skills imparted, what these workshops are doing is fostering a community of small-scale food producers, engaging them with like-minded people and plugging them into a food supply chain from which most of us are profoundly disconnected. It might seem like a very trivial act to take a crate of cabbage stalks destined for the bin and turn them into something at all. I'm sure it is. There's no doubt that compared to the waste perpetrated by farmers and by large chains, it is very small. But the fact is, at the moment, the future of our food systems is very uncertain. Obviously, this is something that Professor Tim Lang talked about at length and much more expertly than I could ever do. But great success has been had by various chefs, people like Hugh Fanning Whittingstall, to lobby the EU to change wasteful laws and attitudes in the farming and the fishing industries particularly. Uh, in light of the events of the past few weeks, that's all up in the air, really. No one kind of knows what's going to happen next. Our fish supplier uh, at the cafe is uh, quite a, a, well, he was a strong support, a supporter of the Leave campaign, the Fishing for Leave campaign. He comes from a lowest oft fishing family who have seen, as they see it, they've seen their industry devastated by the effects of the EU. Whether that's fair, it's not for me to, I think there's obviously other forces at stake there. But even he is now thinking, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen to our fleets, to our quotas, to any of those sort of things. So, our extrication from the Union, from all these things, will probably take years if it happens at all. And no one seems to know what will happen next or who is in charge will protect and subsidise our food and our farms. Perhaps we should focus on the things that we can change, however small they might be. The food we eat and share and the communities in which we do so are some of those things. I know it's tiresome to hear chefs like me who get some of the best produce in the country delivered to their back door, lecture others on shopping small, shopping local, shopping in markets, so I won't, except to note that greengrocers are almost universally cheaper than supermarkets. They stock a better range of fresh vegetables than all but the largest ones. I know there's more things than money to, be, to kind of worry about when you're talking about the availability of these things. People are time pressed. Anyway, even if they were ex more expensive, the more expensive the product you buy, the greater the incentive to use it all, which I think is the main thing here. People buy things cheaply, they chuck them away. My own incentive came really from watching our growers work when I saw how much work they would put into just a field of Cavolo Nero to some radishes. How could I throw away a third or even a half of the product of their labours, even if it was conventional waste, just because it took a bit more time to prepare? And the, the, kind of the moral 
I suppose, imperative led to an aesthetic one. And once I realised the deliciousness which can be wrung out of cauliflower and kale stalks, carrot peelings and squid guts, I could no more bring myself to throw them away than I would, as a chef, beef bones or offal or fish carcasses, which you can make stock out or which you can feed people. Uh, there's a sense of responsibility that comes from belonging to a community like this. I might feel it more keenly because I work with the gardeners, I know the fishermen, I know the farmers and I know the butchers, but I think everybody who eats really is a real part of it. Anyway, all of this for me wouldn't really mean anything if the end result didn't taste really good, which luckily I think it did. Um, if you could pass that jar up. <coughs> I've been informed I'm not allowed to do a tasting in here because there's a carpet and we might get pickle on the carpet. Uh, but this, I was going to bring uh, some of my, the squid garum, the fermented fish sauce that I deal with in my paper, but I don't know how well it travels and I didn't really want to cause an international botulism <laughs> thing. So instead, I brought something else I mentioned which is this compost kimchi. This is made from cavolo nero stalks, which are salted and sugared, and then mixed with a paste of previously fermented seaweed uh, to kind of replace the fish sauce you get, garlic and chilli. This was made in April, so it's quite well aged. It's been maturing in the, uh, in the fridge for a while, so it is strong, it's intense. It's something to be used as a condiment rather than an eating vegetable. Um, as I said before, you have these things which, are, they, as ferments rather than pickles, they kind of develop over time. They kind of, they change their nature. Though it's, I think this particular pickle's high point was a couple of months after it was ready, when some combination of the garlic and the kind of brassical stench combined to produce something which really <laughs> smelt of truffle, really strongly of truffle. Um, which obviously, as we know, truffles themselves produce that particular aroma because it's an impersonation of pigs' testicles. It's the hormone that attracts pigs to hunt mm. them. So you see that kind of offal calls to offal. They're very similar, <laughs> very, very similar smells. So anyway, I'll be down in the foyer with some spoons if anyone would like to try this afterwards. But if not, sorry? The vegetables. This is Cavolo Nero, yeah, so the black cabbage. Uh, Thank you. Have we any questions? I know we will we'll have tastings. Yes. Yeah, I grew up um, on a place that has huge gardens. We can, we preserve, we pickle, we filter, we sell it. Uh, I still do a fair amount mm -hmm. of candy, but recently I've become more concerned about the carbon impact of that on a home scale and just looking at the, you know, what that is. What is your take on that? The carbon impact of preserving or um, on that? Preserving, yes, especially I grew up with the American method where you know, we immerse it in and take it for the 10 minutes of the Oh, I see the cooking and so yeah. forth. Yeah. This the process. The processing of this food and apparently the, the carbon impact at, at home is much higher than what you say. I suppose it would be because yeah. the kind of economies of scale you get, but so with anything. There, because. I partly do this because of these supposed health benefits of the live bacteria you get. Nothing we pickle generally is processed like that. This is completely uncooked. So it's raw kale stalks, salt rubbed into them, everything is completely raw. So we don't even, probably shouldn't tell you this, I don't even sterilise the bottles. <laughs> <laughs> How many people are still there looking for it? Any other questions? Sorry. It's, uh, I've got some cards with me that point on. It's called Darsham Nurseries Cafe. It's in Suffolk, in the middle of nowhere in Suffolk. That's most of Suffolk is. <laughs> yeah, we'll start off here, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for that. It was a great sort of self-reflexive view of sort of what you do on a daily basis. And you really described this um, very complex sort of negotiations you had to do sort of in your head as you went to your job every day. But I was just wondering, like, how, how, how do you do that with this, like understanding of how complicated things are. I mean, is it like an existential crisis every day? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious. I think it probably would be if I forced myself to actually think about the kind of the waste involved, the place in the supply chain, which is why, as I say, I just try to do a small, <laughs> a small thing about it each time. But um, 
there's, I think there's always going to be waste involved in restaurants. Uh, I used to work actually in a large college canteen. That was my first kitchen job, and the waste involved was astonishing. The amount of food we threw away was disgusting. I worked up there first at a summer school, um, so everyone there would have paid in advance for their meals and were given out small portioned amounts. So you'd have these starving Italian kids coming through who'd been doing boring language school stuff all day, and you'd give them these neat portions of pie or lasagna or whatever and tell them they could only have one bread roll each, which would be completely alien to a, a continental style of eating, to only have one bread roll. And then having done that for an hour, you'd throw probably a portion of pie about half the size of this table straight into the gobbler, mm. the, the food disposal unit. Um, obviously that's an extreme example, but any kitchen, any commercial kitchen, unless they only have take pre-bookings, unless they have a completely set menu, you've got this huge amount of waste involved. So uh, I guess if I really cared about it, I'd stop working in kitchens <laughs> and do something else. But as it is, I try to do a small, a small thing about it as I can. So a number of the, I worked in restaurants both Europe and UK, uh, mm -hmm. as, well, as travel I guess, parts of UK, and North America, and a lot of the, the municipalities now, they're trying to control ways via how much, they, they charge you different for trash versus compost right. bowls versus yeah. recyclables. Toronto does it by selling the bags, actually, so they control it. Uh, I was wondering where you are, are they doing anything? Um, we yeah, I suppose they do. We compost all our own stuff, obviously, because we have the garden centre. But for recycling and bins, you have a a bin of a certain size, and you have to pay more for another bin. So yeah, that's I suppose but that's a way of taking. Check. Or if you were to do your composting through the city, do you pay a different for that trash versus the regular? Trash? To be honest, I have yes. no idea. It is the local authorities system in Britain is a complete mess. There's no universalism. Yeah. What, what's holding it up at the moment? What's recycled? Yeah. Well, what's recyclable yeah. is different in. There's no standardisation. Yeah, there's, no there's no agreement of how to separate energy. So it's a total mess. So you're quite right. It's systemic. There's mm -hmm. no better in the US. Just to no. comment on your Toronto thing, I'll get yeah, to the question. Uh, so, yes, it's in Toronto, it's in Oregon. Uh, the green recycling is in a lot of different places. But I was going to comment probably from the last one that in a lot of places municipal composting can't occur because they don't actually have a municipal composter, they only have landfill, which is a very big problem. So reduction as well as actual deferral or treatment method is needed. And yeah, there's a lot of municipalities that problems there. I was just going to kind of go, so you say, yes, waste in restaurants is a problem, and you've also kind of gone that we don't need to eat out, so to speak, yes. because of that. But kind of my, all I'm grappling with in terms of food waste is the every single person who cooks is an individual and the waste we create is an individual. You can aggr aggregate it to a mm -hmm. population level and say young people, if they're cooking waste more than older people, if you know different incomes and different ethnicities waste differently when you do dinner. Mm -hmm. Surely though, a cook and a trained cook, you're in a restaurant, you're living at the margin, you're trying to get every ounce and every bit of, of food and value yeah. out of that. Yeah. So surely, Restaurants and eating out is actually the optimal version of wastage. Just, just, just thinking about it in terms of you are so passionate about this, and so any of the waste, any of the compost that you put into that bin, there's no, for want of a better thing, Marxist use value, use value <laughs> left in there. And so surely you are doing the best that you can, and people should be eating out or eating in. Sure, you'll get this pie at the end that you'll be chucking in the bin, but that can also be going to a food bank. That's rather true. than people yes. eating at home. So it's just it's whether those systems are in place. I suppose my, my point is with restaurants is that unless you're one of the lucky businesses that are rammed all of the time, you're always going to be cooking food that does that isn't going to get eaten. And in most cases there isn't the kind of systems in place to take as there should be to take it to food banks, to take it to, to uh, charities and stuff that deal with it. I suppose that's what I mean. Yeah. You know, there's always you're cooking for more customers than you there are a lot of the time. There are two questions over here, then we come over here. We have here. a lot of small uh, hog farmers in mm -hmm. the Willamette Valley in Oregon, and they have a regular pickup point. They go to restaurants and pick up all the waste and feed their hogs. Is that something that That's illegal. What's that? It's illegal it's in illegal. Britain. We did that here. We did that for years and years and years. And years. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 It has to be. Yeah, no, but let's just cook, you know, cook food in the restaurant. No, but they're there's, there's, a, there's two or three categories, I think, of food waste that can be fed to pigs, which is like spent hops from brewing or spent grain. But it's since 
I think it's since BAC, you're not allowed to just uh, so you take. Know, you're feeding, you're not feeding, you know, animal, animal yes, product, yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Okay. Okay. Sorry, Tim had a question. <laughs> I agree with the end of the comment. I like the fact that you were being very philosophical as a shepherd. I think that's really Thank you. Um, my point is that I think in a lot of these discussions, uh, the core issue is missed, which is poor consumers waste almost nothing. Rich consumers are the biggest wasters. Mm. That is the universal position. The UN, I, my team, we, we co-deal UNEPS, the United Nations Environment Programme, to review. And this is what comes up. Rich societies waste food, poor society consumers right. waste almost nothing. Mm. But it's about 8% of poor societies. And I mean Malawi, Botswana. And what's happened in rich societies like yourself, us, mm. is that that's got messy. Uh, the, the, the pattern has been broken. And it's partly, I agree with you, it's about price and value, mm. and values and not just value. Um, but that fundamental reality is not being addressed. And you as an individual chef cannot address that. Right. It's the point that's being made there. It's mm. systemic. Yes. It's about the nature of production. But, and this is my second point, it is, I, I sat, I was a government commissioner in Britain, mm -hmm. so I was responsible actually for the development of the waste thinking in Britain. It, it seemed to me it was almost impossible for a society to exist where there wasn't waste. Right. We, we have to remember that there's a real danger of moralizing waste as being, you know, totally evil. It is intrinsic. Even in my household, pineapple peelings, we don't eat them. <laughs> it bones. Mm. Uh, the issue is what you do with it. You know, how yes, you that's it. true. And you as an individual chef cannot possibly deal with that. But the catering industry, mm. you're absolutely right, it's now much more in the States. It's an almost equal amount of food is consumed in food service, in Britain it's now 30%. Right. That is very interesting. We want to be in touch with the Sustainable Restaurants Association, which has been doing experiments, piloting things. Yes. So yeah. really interesting. Yeah, there's places like Silo and stuff. Yeah. Really. And there is, there's... A lot of thinking going on. And the more importantly, practice. And yes. Yeah. And going back to what you said about pig waste, there is a, a restaurant-led, uh, I can't remember what they're called. Well, an attempt to try and change the Yeah, to get the, the lobby group. One of the things that's discussed in Brexit. Yes, of course. There are a lot of restaurateurs who want to get rid of the ban on recycling of food. And food well, because you've got more and more places like Pitkew and who have their own animals, uh, they're going to want to feed their own waste to animals, logically. The question I'm here is then, Doreen has a question. <coughs> on that point about rich or poor and waste, but there's one thing which kind of seems to make a bit of a difference in terms of how much gets wasted. So things like with electricity, sort of smart meters and more visibility of where, where things are going. So I don't know if you've heard of the stuff I think called Winnow that's trying to give restaurants a better picture of systematically what's being right. wasted. Because you really have that. It makes it a bit easier. So mm. this is crazy. We're wasting this much every week on just that front. Yeah, so that, that was developed by the system. But uh, that ties into that thing of saying that the, uh, the restaurants have both the profit motive and the scale to actually try and to, to, to deal with that. that. Yeah. Systems do get more efficient. Certain types of restaurants, if we're talking fast food, you're talking volume and part of the customer yes. experience is the abundance and the opulence yeah. of going in. Right? So, yeah. Sorry, it's not the question, but I just think even for those that are not Western tourists and those who are, basically, it's think about having hands. It's one of the really brilliant ways of recycling food. Uh, even if you have just a solid lawn, I mean, people have to use on their wheels sometimes, you could have, say, four hands yeah. and then uh, chicken coop, you mm. could get the, the straps. Mm, that's true. Eggs are so much better when they have not just meal but food scraps. Mm. I think uh, I think on that note, <laughs> and particularly in mind that there, I'm sure there's plenty of you who want to have a taste of this stuff here downstairs. Before I'd like to just a round of applause. For it. Thank you.